so right. Folks, the number to call, 646-727-3387. You can also Skype in using the Skype icon at the top of the chat screen. Um, we'll take your phone calls, your questions, your comments. Uh, so don't be bashful. If you have any call or questions for uh, Griff, John, myself, or Michael, uh, we'd be happy to take your call. Griff, uh, how do you see it going down? I mean, uh, again, you know, I can't, I cannot say this enough, and I know you can't. Self and family is the only real good posture that you can take in order to yeah. uh, be able to sustain yourself through this. Well, I'm going to break bad here and really express myself the way the way I feel about what's coming. Mm -hmm. Everybody hang on to their chairs. Uh, I'm hanging. Here, here it comes. Um, what's coming at us now in, in the near future is nothing like what happened in the 20s, 30s, the Depression. Nothing like that. Uh, that was uh, not felt by everybody in the country. Uh, a lot of people felt it. A lot of people died. A lot of people were wiped out financially. But the money system didn't collapse. It never collapsed. Uh, this time we're looking at a, a total devastation. We're looking at a financial Armageddon, certainly in the United States and, and around the world. Uh, nothing like this has ever happened in the history of, of the world. It, there's nothing, there's no precedent to go back. You can look at the Civil War, the Revolution. You can look at all the wars in the world, and nothing has happened quite like this one. This is a different beast coming at us. It's not just the monetary collapse. It's the the, uh, the the cutoff of all commodities coming into the country. We we have no manufacturing. We've let that go to foreign countries. We can't even produce our own shoes and underwear. Come on, you know all of the things that go to uh, to sustain our uh, quality of life is uh, gone. We've let it go out of the country. We cannot rebuild it fast. It would take many, many years, many years under good conditions to rebuild that. The conditions that are going to befall us are brutal, brutal. We're going to be sitting around eating dirt. Come on. The only people that are really going to survive this are the people that are willing to kill. And and if, if, you, see, if you see people coming down the street with guns at you, you blow them away. Now, if the Christians out here and the religious people um, recoil back in their chairs from hearing that, then they will die too. You will have death on top of death because your laws are not going to have any effect. There will be no law enforcement. There will be nobody to stand with you. If somebody wants to kick your door down, you've got to blow them away before they kick your door down. It's that simple. You're going to have guards um, patrolling neighborhoods 24-7. To, to sustain life and, and protect the children, protect your food supplies. That's what's coming. It's not a depression. It's a collapse. Collapse will be like dominoes going in every direction. Now, if that isn't bad enough, this, uh, this Gulf situation is bad. You could very well, and I suspect at some point in time, you're going to have upwards to 30, 40 million people fleeing with nowhere to go and nothing to eat and no money and no assets and no shelter and no nothing. 30 million people coming at you. Um, there is no safety net. How do you deal with it? That isn't bad enough. Your water aquifers are going to be affected. God knows how far with the, uh, with the um, methane and the um, petroleum coming out of the ground. They haven't stopped that. It's still coming out. Now we're affecting the Gulf Streams and other parts of the world, and we're affecting weather. At the same time, you have Russian scalar weapons of manipulating weather patterns over the United States. Then you have a United States scalar stopping the hurricanes from coming into the Gulf. If it, if it happened, then you would have more dead people by the millions with the water and the oil and the chemistry dumped on their heads and on their uh, soils, on their cities. Right now, many... Uh, farm-growing lands are contaminated, and um, it's questionable what the products are going to be like. So it's a, it's a series of catastrophic events coming that ha has no precedent, and uh, it's going to be rough. The Constitution is only good as your guns and your willingness to kill people for that Constitution. 
that's what happened when I was riding with Ben Martin in South Carolina in 1775. <laughs> and we That's a first-hand account. And Wallace right. all the way up to Yorktown and finally forced him. To, thank God the French got here in time. You know, we, <laughs> we wouldn't. <laughs> but, you know, how many dead bodies did we leave uh, all the way up to Cornwallis? It's 1881. I remember that was a good year, uh, eight, uh, 1781 in Yorktown. You left uh, dead bodies all the way up and down the the coast, uh, but people today are not willing to do that. If if I said that to Christians, or religious Christians that go to church, they would recoil. They wouldn't like it. They wouldn't like me to say the reality of what's coming and what they're going to have to do to save their heinies. If they don't, they're going to be piles and piles of bodies in America for any number of different reasons. It's going to be brutal. What do you think, Joe? Well, I I agree with you, Griff. I mean, there's you have to differentiate between a depression, which we're in now, and a collapse, which is a total breakdown of society. And then you get pockets, you know, and that's that's really what it comes down to. And 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 Michael, what do you think? How do you feel uh, about what Griff said there? I, I'm really interested in in, in your feedback. Well, before I start, I want to tell Griff that I was at Lexington Green. I was the guy who fired the shot heard around the world. <laughs> you know, my name has never really gotten into the papers, but that was me. I'm exposed. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I was standing next to you there in the square. Yeah, I remember. I remember. Um, and Thomas Jefferson said the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. And there were a lot of Americans who wear give me liberty or give me death t-shirts. But, I mean, they don't really understand what that concept is. It's give me liberty or give me death. And you are absolutely correct. I I couldn't find a single thing that I would disagree with. Um, You know, only those of us that are willing to, to kill to stay alive are going to be alive. Yes. Um, uh, it's an appropriate time that I tell you that uh, Patrick Henry did not say those words. It was William Wirt, W-I-R-T, and uh, Judge St. George Tucker that wrote Patrick Henry's speech. Patrick Henry did not write that. <laughs> well, he delivered it well enough. <laughs> no, he didn't. He didn't deliver that speech. Oh, he didn't it was deliver made it? Up, no, it was made up 30 years after the uh, the uh, St. John's Church meeting by William Wirt and Judge St. George Tucker. They wrote it. I see. And uh, Jefferson well, looked at uh, it and he called it fiction. A lot of uh, propaganda, uh, you know, for the Boston Massacre. The British soldiers were really defending themselves against the mob, but uh, Paul Revere uh, carved uh, uh, an engraving. It was the the photography of its time showing the British soldiers lined up shoulder to shoulder, you know, shooting at what appeared to be innocent civilians, uh, you know, the total political spin. And um, Well, that's the way you do it. Yeah. That's what you do, yeah. History is written by the victors. Yes, all the time. John, you got a comment? Uh, Yeah, Joe, thank you. Um, Back in them days, it was give me liberty or give me death, but I think the modern, uh, these days, uh, people are giving up their liberties to avoid death because they're afraid of death. The government knows that, so we have to put those cameras up those red lights to protect you, okay? So you got to give up a little bit of your liberty so that we can make you feel safe. They only say feel, they never say are, because... It's better to feel safe than to be safe, right? Hey, uh, Optimus Prime, you need to reconnect. Uh, uh, you sound like a transformer. <laughs> I, we couldn't understand a thing you said. So, uh, hey, John, reconnect for me, will you? And uh, and 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 then we'll uh, get that comment again. Uh, yeah, it's interesting that you say that. You know, history's written by the victors. I, I think it was. I just came under the realization that uh, Paul Revere uh, really never – he wasn't the major guy that rode the horse. As a matter of fact, his route was only 
I think it was like 10 miles. It was from, uh, uh, where was it from? It was from um, Boston to say like Cambridge or something like that. And I, I'm I'm kind of, kind of, um, I'm at a loss because I can't remember. But the real guy that did it, and his first name was Ichabod, I think. I can't remember. It's not Ichabod Crane. I know that. But it's, uh, he had a really interesting name. He was the one that rode all the way from Boston down to Philadelphia. Well, but, there were there were several writers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Paul Revere was just one of them, and and like everything else, Paul Revere was made famous by the poem. Right. Um, but you have to remember that um, ten miles was a long way. Oh sure. I mean that that was a distance, and uh, I don't know when the last time you had your butt in a saddle, but you try <laughs> try riding ten miles at a full gallop. <laughs> I think you'll be a little bit bowlegged. That, that's a that's a feat. <laughs> You're probably right. Now, Griff, uh, uh, how would you feel having to ride all that way on a horse? I know you've got quite an experience with that. <laughs> I was in the Philippine <laughs> Islands years ago, and they said, "Come on, Griff, we're going to go horseback riding." And I did. I got on the horse, and it was the first and last horse I ever want to get on. <laughs> it was the most painful experience I've ever had. That was it. <laughs> no, I, I'm, hey, I'm right there with you. I, I know it's a, it's a, it's a painful experience. I, I myself have only done it once, and even then, uh, the ice packs came out soon after. So I mean, it was, it was bad. But I mean, I can totally understand that. Um, so we've established that that you know, this collapse is going to be tragic and that the only way to really survive it, you have to be willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. And might I add, too, you know, Griff, um, you talk about the Christians that that won't take up arms because they uh, because of whatever whatever they believe. But the Bible itself is an extremely bloody book. And there was many times throughout the Bible where uh, Christians uh, were instructed by God. Moses, himself, or pardon me, Moses was, instruct, was was instructed by God to kill half his people at one point in time. You know, so it, for for Christians to say, and everybody has their own thing, and believe me, liberty says, or be, the libertarian in me says, you do whatever you want to do, that's fine by me. But um, l- let me tell you something, there is nothing wrong with defending yourself or defending your family against uh, an armed intruder or anybody that wants to do you harm. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. And um, and I don't know what what's your comments on that, Michael? What do you think? I have I'm frequently invited to speak in various locations. I spoke uh, earlier this summer mm-hmm. at the uh, Libertarian Texas, the Texas Libertarian Convention in Austin. And as a speaker, I consider it my responsibility to analyze the audience and take them right to the edge of their comfort zone and then push them one or two steps further. (laughs) And so Texans are very proud of the Alamo. And, you know, after I pointed out that 189 guys died on the inside and 1,900 guys died on the outside and, you know, 10 to 1 odds, you know, you know, all that stuff. I I asked the audience a question. I said, hey, you know, who's who's willing to die for liberty? And a vast majority of people raised their hand. I said, why? Why would you want to die for liberty? Then you don't have liberty because you don't have life. You know, and I point out that in the movie Patton, George C. Scott impersonating Patton says that uh, a war is not won by dying for your country. A war is won by making the other poor guy die for his country. He said making the bastard die for his country. Yeah, well, I was was trying to clean it up for radio. (laughs) Hey, I appreciate that. (laughs) I mean, I know the movie. Good good, good looking out, Michael. Yeah, when when I teach my class, I I really add a little bit of color. Uh, Your hair will come out blue when I'm done. Shame on you, Griff. That's uh, Patton. (laughs) Uh, the, the, you know, after after I convinced people that, you know, you don't want to die for liberty, I said, really, the question is, how many people are willing for liberty? And, and this vast hush 
win over the audience is they're going, oh, my God, did Michael actually say that out loud? And it's like, well, yeah, this is bad narc. You know, 